Hey guys, good afternoon. Today we're going to be working on our 289 bottom end uh, from our 1966 Mustang project. But first, we want to say thank you to all you new subscribers who have signed on to the channel. Uh, you're keeping us motivated, keeping work uh, moving here in the shop, and we really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. Alright, well like I was saying before I got so rudely interrupted here, today we're going to be tearing apart the uh, bottom end from our 289 small block. We're going to pull the uh, main bearing caps, we're going to pull the rod caps, we're going to inspect all the journals on the crank, make sure that all the journals are within spec, we're going to mic everything out, make sure that they are all sized uh, correctly before we order any bearings because you've got to know the proper journal size for your bearings before you order them. Some blocks and some cranks have been machined. Uh, the, the, the bore in the block could be oversized and the crank could be undersized. So we need to know exactly what dimensions everything is before we order any bearings. And we need to inspect all the journals and make sure that everything is straight and square and in line uh, before we decide if we're going to do any machine work. If we have to get a line bore on the crank uh, journals uh, in the block, then we've got to send it out um, to the machine shop along with the cylinder heads and get that block straightened out. So without further ado here guys, I'm going to get to work. Alright guys, so we're about to tear down uh, the bottom end here on our 289 small block. Um, and there's some things you want to be aware of when you're about to tear your, tear your motor down here and pull your crankshaft and your rods and pistons out of the block, bare block. Um, you, tolerances are very tight inside the engine block here. Uh, the pistons and the counterweights on the crankshaft have small amounts of clearance uh, between them to keep everything as compact and tight as possible in here. Uh, and you don't want to nick any anything. So as you're disassembling uh, the crankshaft, you're going to be pushing the pistons out of the bores from the bottom. You don't want to snag any of the rod bolts on the piston bores inside the engine block and scratch them up. You also don't want to nick the crankshaft journal with the uh, rod bolts as you're pushing the piston and rod out of the bore. So one little tip that you can do here to tr protect things when you're disassembling uh, your rods from your crankshaft is you can take a piece of hose that's appropriate sized for your rod bolts. In this case I'm using some 5 16 fuel line I've got laying around and clip off about an inch and a half uh, of, of hose. And what you'll do is when you take the uh, cap retaining bolts or nuts off of the rod cap, pop the cap off and slip your tube over the threads on the rod bolt. So that that way when you push the rod out and away from the crankshaft, you don't nick the journal and you also don't nick the bores as you're pushing that piston and rod assembly out through the uh, bores in the block. So that's how I'm going to do it. Um, you also want to make sure that you mark all of your caps if your caps aren't marked. In this case, uh, the forward block here has all of the main bearing caps are numbered. So one, two, three, four, and five. The last one isn't numbered, but that's because it's our main uh, main cap on the last journal here on the crankshaft. Uh, the rod caps are also numbered, so um, all of the rods have a have a stamp on them. In this case, this is number two rod. It's got a stamp on the rod itself and on the cap. So you can't clock it incorrectly. It's only stamped on one side of the rod. So when you reassemble it, as long as the numbers are on the same side, your cap's on the right way. And as long as the numbers match, you've got the right rod cap on the right rod. So it makes it really easy. Now you do have to rotate this assembly as you take these rods out so that you can get clearance uh, and you can easily reach the rod nuts um, or the cap retaining nuts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this lobe here that's already uh, already up and easy to get to. I'm going to pop both rod caps off, set them aside, tap the piston down using a, using my thread cover here, my, my hose on the threads to protect them. Tap the pistons down as far as I can get them away from this journal on the crank and then rotate the crank. I think I'll rotate it up and attack this one here next. Take the cap off, same process. So on this motor, because it's an economy V8, it's a small 289 uh, V8, it wasn't built for high horsepower. Um, the crank main bearing retainers, which are these five here, 
uh, bearing caps, some people call them, are only two bolt mains. So that means that there's only two bolts retaining each bearing into position into the block. Now these caps are machined in such a way that they match the block. So you want to make sure when you re reinstall them that you install them to the correct direction. These caps have a uh, arrow that points towards the snout or the pulley on the front of the crankshaft. So it's pretty easy to get these back on and they're also numbered as well so you can put them in the right order and you don't get the caps mixed up. Um, if your motor is not marked and your, cap, your caps aren't numbered or marked in such a way that you can't install them incorrectly, you need to make sure to number them. A uh, method you can use for that is using a, a punch and a hammer and put uh, one dot on the first one, two on the second, three on the third, four on the fourth, and leave the last one unmarked or vice versa. So that, so that you can clearly designate which way and which orientation the cap uh, goes onto which crank journal. So because this is not an aluminum block and it's not a four bolt main, there's really no trick to it, just take the bolts out. So I'm going to use my air tools to disassemble this. Just start with these rods here on the end and then work, work my way through the rod pairs and get, uh, get the rods and pistons pushed down away from the crank as far as I can. <coughs> Always check and make sure you're running the right direction so you don't snap any of these bolts. Now once you've got your nuts taken off of the rods, if you get lucky, oh look at that, the caps will pull straight off like butter. Sometimes you've got to give them a little bit of a tap and loosen them up. This one is going to fight me. But I got one off. So for removal, we're going to use a hammer, but we're not going to use the hard end, we're going to use the soft end. and. Uh, Give them a little bit of a tap, try and pop those rod bolts loose. There we go. We take our fuel line covers here so that we protect the crank. Yeah, that one's, that one's going to be stubborn. Protect the crank from damage and protect those bores from damage as well. Muscle them out of there. Make sure you don't snag the rod on the corner of the uh, of the bore, the cylinder bore on the inside of the engine block. Try and be careful that you don't scratch them up, ding them up. So now that we've got those four pistons out of the bores, we can rotate the crank around and tackle the, the next four remaining pistons and rods. Now it's time to move on to the main bearing caps. So same process here, we'll just switch out the sockets, pull the main bearing caps loose, probably have to tap them a little bit and get them uh, broke free from the block and uh, pull it off. So now with all the uh, main bearing cap retaining bolts out, uh, if we get easy, or if we get lucky, like we are with this front one, the cap will just come off the block. And we can see the same, same amount of wear here on the mains as we saw on the rods. 
so now we can remove the crank. They are heavy, so you know, bear that in mind. Be prepared when you pick it up so you don't fumble it and drop it and bend it. Okay guys, so with the uh, rotating assembly out of the way, we've got the pistons rods, we've finally got the cam and the distributor drive out of the block. Uh, last thing to pull out is our lifters. Uh, most of the time lifters will just push out. Um, you want to rotate that cam a couple times both directions before you go ahead and pull the cam out. That pushes all the lifters back into their lifter bores. Um, get the cam out of the way and then you should be able to just pop those lifters out on a motor that's been recently run that is in good shape and isn't full of corrosion and gunk um, you can pull the lifters out of the top with a good strong magnet um, in most cases sometimes you gotta rotate them a little bit but they'll come out um, in this case I've got a couple stuck ones that I'm gonna have to hammer out of there unfortunately uh, and try not to bung up the lifter bores too bad but I'm gonna push out all the ones I can by hand and uh, knock out the other ones with the BFH. Now being that I'm replacing all of these lifters and it looks like uh, the camshaft as well, which I'll explain later, um, I'm going to go ahead and punch them out of there with the punch and just tap them out gently. Um, if you're trying to keep your lifters in good shape, you don't want to be hitting them with the punch. It's a hardened, hardened face on the lifter and your best bet is to use something soft against that and tap them out, maybe a wood dowel or something, and try to work it back and forth a little bit and get them tapped out. In my case, I'm not worried about saving them. What I am worried about, though, is scoring up the bore where the lifter slides into the block. It's a machine fit. It's got to be tight tolerance. Um, lifters are powered internally by uh, hydraulic action from your oil pressure. So this has to be a good tight fit. If it's too loose, you'll have a lifter that won't operate right and you'll have a dead valve. So you don't want to score up your bores. So while I was tapping them out, I wasn't beating them out of there. And uh, by just lightly tapping, I could feel if there was any resistance. There wasn't really any resistance, so uh, they tapped right on out. And I'll inspect all the bores here and take a look at them. Worst case scenario, if you have to have your bores machined, they can do that. They can punch them oversize, and then you'll just have to run a bigger bore lifter. Um, in our case, we're not going to have to do any of that. All right, guys, so we've got our block just about completely stripped down. There's still some passageways that need to be opened up. Uh, all the freeze plugs need to get knocked out of there. Um, I'm going to do that off the engine stand. I think it's just easier to flip the block around without having to rotate it here on the stand. Plus, you can't really get to the back side of the block with, the, with it bolted to your engine stand. These blocks aren't super heavy, but they are, uh, they are pretty heavy and especially if you have a big block or something that's a little bigger than a little small block like this, you might want to get some help uh, to pull it off the stand. I'm going to try and muscle it off of here and see if I can't uh, avoid herniating myself. And there you go. I'll be calling my chiropractor in the morning. So now that all the physical work is done, I've got the engine block off the engine stand and uh, we've completely disassembled everything. Now we've got to inspect it and uh, I'm going to make a list of the items that I'm going to uh, replace and need to order, uh, the items that I'm going to rebuild, and the items that need to go out for machining so I can get all the machining components together take all those to the machine shop and get everything done in one one fell swoop um, order all my parts and components so I can get the new stuff on the way and start rebuilding um, the pieces and components that we need to rebuild and clean a lot of cleaning in this job
if you see evidence of this kind of scoring on your bearings, you need to take a really close look at your crank and see if there's any embedded metal particles in your crank uh, or if your crank exhibits the same kind of wear as what you're seeing in the bearing. It certainly should. The rod bearings show similar wear. You can see this one here is pretty, uh, pretty well thrashed. Um, it was run for a good period of time with poor maintenance and uh, actually has some hot spotting here from uh, contamination that had built up between the rod journal and the rod bearing itself. There's usually a fix though. If your crank hasn't been ground uh, more than twice, I think, you can uh, get the crank journals ground down ten thousandths or even twenty thousandths if it has to go that far and then you run a thicker bearing that takes up the gap between the uh, smaller diameter crank journal and the uh, component whether it's a rod or or a, a bearing cap in this case on a main bearing <clears throat> on your thrust bearings you're gonna see uh, copper here which is signs of side loading on the crank that's a fairly normal amount of wear nothing if we had just tossed some oil in here and, and started this engine up, um, we would have seriously damaged the crankshaft there where that uh, corroded bearing is. So as I mentioned in an earlier video and earlier today, um, the lifters in your V8 pushrod engine, um, anything after like the mid-60s, uh, are hydraulic lifters. They're actually actuated by oil pressure. So um, there's a plunger and a piston and a spring inside the bore of the lifter that's all retained in here with the clip. So there needs to be movement inside the lifters and you can take these apart and clean them. Uh, in this case this one's not terribly bad but uh, this one's a pretty bad one. It has a lot of rust and scale. It's probably one of the lifters I had to tap out of there with a, with a uh, punch. But um, you can take take and disassemble your lifters, clean them if they're in good shape and you expect that there's no damage internally, disassemble them, clean them out, reassemble them, and they're probably good to go. In my case, however, with our 66 Mustang project, we have several lifters, like this one, where you can see that the piston itself is actually pushed down and stuck inside the bore of the lifter. Now, that doesn't mean it's not necessarily repairable, most likely they're damaged to the point that they're not savable and I'm not going to feel comfortable running those lifters uh, even if I disassemble them and clean them. So we're going to replace the lifters. If we look at our cam here, you'll see that there are several lobes of the cam that, that have some scuffs and some wear. That's pretty normal and isn't really a sign to me of damage. But, um, several of the lobes are eroded and actually have pitting from water damage um, on the face of the lobe. And that's something that can't really be repaired without, uh, without welding up the lobe and regrinding the cam. And uh, In this case, for a stock 289 camshaft, it's not really worth it. So fortunately, we have a lot of aftermarket choices, and uh, we can throw a, a good stock or very, very mild street cam uh, in our 289 here, probably for much less than it would cost to uh, try and repair the damage to this old original camshaft. So camshafts and lifters need to be replaced in a set so that uh, you know the faces on both the cam and the lifters are hardened, uh, hardened facing. So you want to have uh, you don't want to run old, worn out lifters on a brand new cam because the cam will end up taking the face. Um, onto the lobe and it'll wear your cam out prematurely and vice versa you wouldn't want to put new lifters on an old camshaft and uh, have similar problems. I've given the crank a quick once over and um, while some of the journals have some uh, some scratches that you can feel with a thumbnail um, which means that they're probably deep enough that it's going to need a grind most of them are, are fine. So I'm going to take it to the machine shop that I take the heads to and see if they can inspect it and what they think if, if they can polish those journals out without uh, having to do a regrind or if they're going to have to grind them down uh, and make the crank undersized. 
The pistons themselves, there's a couple that have some scoring and some damage and some hot spotting, so we may end up having to do a set of pistons. I didn't want to do that initially, I wanted to just re-ring the ones we have, but um, the deeper I get into this, I think there's more wear than I initially thought, and uh, the best course of action is just to rebuild it properly and uh, replace all the pistons as well. So I was able to beat our auto light distributor here out of the block. Uh, it was froze up in the uh, engine block here um, on these two bores. Not sure why it's stuck so badly. Um, and I'm hoping that I didn't damage the shaft when I was beating it out of there. I was trying not to not to hit directly on the shaft too much uh, with any kind of force anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and break it down, take it apart, uh, see if I can check run out on the shaft after I remove the uh, the roll pin that snapped off here on our on our drive gear. We're going to need a, a new rebuild kit with new bushings. Uh, we're going to need a new gear because I uh, had to ding it taking it out. But I think the rest of the uh, dings I put into the body of the distributor can be cleaned up pretty well. I was careful to only whack it where it wouldn't be visible. So um, hopefully a little sanding, a little filing, and I'll be able to clean this aluminum body up pretty easily um, and be able to reuse it. Um, unfortunately, you know, there was more damage than I initially suspected, but on the upside, it's not extensive damage and it's not going to be expensive damage either. Um, and we should be able to uh, replace a few extra components. It's going to cost us a couple hundred more dollars on the rebuild than I initially had anticipated, but um, it's the right thing to do. We'll have a good, solid, brand new motor that's 100%, and uh, the owner of the Mustang here won't have to worry about breaking down in the middle of, uh, the, middle of the desert on the way to Vegas. Fortunately, the, the bulk of our bottom end here was in good shape, and uh, we don't have any significant rust damage to speak of um, so that's a positive that's a big plus um, everything that is destroyed and damaged is uh, wear items so it's it's components that we we're going to replace anyway so as far as the internals on the bottom end we're we're in good shape so today you saw me put the uh, 289 here bottoms up and go elbows deep in there and, uh, and get some good work done uh, we've got the block completely torn down um, I've got to go through and knock the freeze plugs out of it, I've got to knock the cam bearings out of it, um, and some miscellaneous odds and ends still have to come off the block, and then it can be, be cleaned and machined. So initially I was going to do the cleaning and the honing myself, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and take all of this stuff to our machine shop and uh, see if they can freshen this block up, freshen these heads up, and freshen this crankshaft up so we can reassemble it with all new components and have a nice brand new 289 here. Uh, for the owner of our 66 Mustang project. So that's it for today guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all you new subscribers. I hope you kind of enjoyed some of that animation at the beginning of the video. I'm um, kind of new to some of this video editing stuff, but I thought I'd give it a whirl. I thought it came out halfway decent. Let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, please subscribe if you're new. We've got a lot of great content coming, a lot of new projects coming. Um, we're going to be doing some more work on that F350 OBS here soon. Uh, and also some work on Kevin's OBS here soon. So uh, stick with us. Uh, give us a like if you think uh, you like the video. And uh, subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.